Well, I, I, I hardly know, sir. I've changed so many times since this morning, you see. I do not see. Explain yourself. Well, I'm afraid I can't explain myself, sir. Because I'm not myself, you know. I do not know. Well, I can't put it any more clearly, for it isn't clear to me. You? Who are you? Well, don't you think you ought to tell me... I don't know if that got bumped offline already because uh, I, I, uh, that's not my song or my movie. Um, but I, I married the two. Of course, the song is from that 1960s British band, The Who, and the name of the song is Who Are You? And that classic movie, Alice in Wonderland. I've never watched the whole movie nor read the book. It creeped me out as a kid, so I didn't, I didn't even like the Disneyland, uh, the sea ticket ride, if you're old enough to know what that even means, the Alice in Wonderland chaotic experience. And she goes, I can't explain who I am because it's a mystery to me. And, um, and so that's what we want to talk about here this morning, uh, because it's a pressing question. Who are you? Who do you think you are, Buster? Did you ever hear that as a kid? And the question has become even more uh, pressing in our time. The question holds, the answer to the question really does hold the power to shape us, for better or for worse, uh, to shape us as individuals and as you've maybe noticed, uh, as a society uh, in our country in recent years. Who are you? We've talked in recent weeks about the prevailing secular answer to this question, who are you? And we're told uh, it's this mix, as we've said, of, of uh, Darwinian materialism, the material universe of which you're a part is, is all there really is. There's no creator. There's no real design or intention for or point to life. There's no sacred order around which, you know, you were designed to align your life around. But none of that really truly exists, and that's combined with this postmodern mindset, which is basically there are no absolute, no absolute truths, no absolute certainties. And as a consequence, we're just sort of free to make up the answer to that question. You know, who, who am I? What am I? And so, you know, with regard to that question, uh, we um, create our own reality, and we're told things like, um, let your freak... F- let me see if I can get it right. Um, let your freak flag fly. You heard that one? Have you been flying it? Well, this Sunday's message might be for you then. Or, you know, this, there's nothing more powerful than your own truth. You know, um, that, and I've said before, and that is, of course, unless um, it's not true. And then there's actually nothing less powerful than your own truth. And it's and 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 if and if there is objective truth and if there is a real design and intent and purpose for your life, then then really the new liturgy that we're bombarded with, you know, um, create your own, find your own um, identity, this identity of of then of self-centeredness, of of self-discovery, of of, of self. In grandizement of, of, of really self-creation, um, um, follow your heart. You be you. Live your own truth. The only reality is, is what you feel, what you imagine, what you want, what you desire. And, of course, it's a disaster. And we see that on the, you know, the national landscape, you know, um, social, culturally wide and also personally. And so we looked last week at the, uh, the caution that we're given by the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2, 8. I might have put it in your talk notes. I think we have it on the screen. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking, and, and, and even worse and more so, you know, from the God of this world, the enemy of your soul. He says the spiritual powers of this world rather than in Christ. And, and so he says, be careful, don't be taken captive. And, and to be taken captive is much easier than we imagine. Uh, you may have, I put it in your talk notes, whether you may have heard this, or you, possibly not, but you, you know the definition probably. 
and that is the illusionary truth effect. Stated simply as a lie, belie- a lie believed as truth will affect you and affect your life as if it were true. It's in your talk notes. Haven't you seen montages of like the mainstream media where they, they'll show um, one newscast saying the exact same phrasing as 50 others and they would just string them all together? Because they, they know something about the illusionary truth effect. A, a lie, if it's told often enough, will be believed. And if it's believed, even if it isn't true, it'll infect you even as if it were true. And so this illusionary truth um, effect describes you know, how we hear information if it's repeated again and again and again. And what's really interesting, even as if, even when we know on first hearing it, that that couldn't be true. That two plus two is always four, and we're told, no, that's just, uh, what would I say, that's just white bigotry or something along those lines. Or that a boy can be a girl. I mean, things that we just know intuitively, scientifically, that we've known for (laughs) the thousands of years of human history, but if you repeat it often enough, it's astounding how people come to believe it is true and then begin to act as if it is. And when you believe a lie and act as if it is true, it's, it's really disastrous. And so the spiritual powers of this world, you know, they will beguile you. They will, they will answer the question, who are you, in a way that really twists your soul. As I'll talk about here in a moment, that turns it inward, that affects your, affects your affections. And that's why I didn't, I, I, put, I think we'll put it on the screen here, a, a passage I just threw in as I was going to bed last night. I thought, this is so much the heart of what I want to say today. What John writes in his first letter when he says, verse 15 of chapter 2, do not love the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. You know, like the very thing for which you were made, the very thing that will give your life its intended purpose and order and meaning. He says, for the love the world offers um, only a, a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, the pride of achievement and possessions. He says, these really aren't from the Father, but they're from the world. What did he say earlier? The spiritual powers of this world rather than Christ up there in Colossians. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. In other words, John is saying, man, you don't want to miss the love of God. You don't want to miss that your identity is, is rooted and grounded in that. And that alone, really, everything else will just twist your soul, leave you empty. And then you'll find yourself believing this lie from Genesis 3. And I said last week, which basically... The serpent's lie in the garden was basically, in other words, you can create utopia, a blissful, happy, meaningful life of fulfillment apart from God, that that you can do that. And, And of course, the consequences seen in Genesis 3 and throughout all human history is quite apparent to all of us. You miss out, you miss out on the very thing you were created for, to know God and to love him and to be loved by him. And and that really is the only place ultimately where you can find the answer that we most deeply ache for to this question. You know, who are you? I've said before that Martin Luther described our sinful condition and the Latin phrase is something like incurvitus in se or something. And I, you can go online like I did and then um, try to get the Latin, I don't speak Latin, um, pronunciation, correct pronunciation, so you sound smart when you're talking to people, like I'm not sounding right now. Um, and uh, here's the only problem is, is that the computer-generated voice is more confusing than what I just said. And you might also pick up a, a computer virus. So I don't know, I just would just let it, i just read it silently in my notes if I were you. But I put the definition there. The Latin means turned in on itself. And that's what he said, really, sin is like a soul turned in on itself. 
St. Augustine was getting at this when he said, there's two ultimate loves in life. One is to love God and, and love yourself. And of course, you know what Jesus said, you know, when he said the Bible summed up as loving God and loving others as, as yourself. And St. Augustine, you know, is basically getting there is that the only way to truly um, <clears throat> love yourself in the proper biblical sense is to see yourself as created by God, as, as his image bearer, made in his likeness, to live for his glory. As we said from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. It's the only way that you really can love yourself to, to do what is best for yourself. And so um, the renewal and the healing, the transformation of a soul curved in on itself um, is really um, a part of the journey of what it means to be a Jesus follower and to, walk with, and to walk with him as we accept him as our savior and we submit to him and his lordship. He takes us in that journey of healing, turning our soul you know, right side out. And so... That's what Jesus came for, not just to save us. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to come back. You just accept Jesus, get your, forgive, your sins forgiven, you know, your eternal security um, purchased by his blood and accepting that as a gift. But, it, but he's, he came to do more than just that. He came to restore what was broken, the soul turned in on itself, to bring us closer to the answer to this question who, who am I? Now, we'll spend the rest of our time addressing that and barely scratching the surface, but also a good portion of it just talking about, you know, the kind of toxic alternatives the, you know, the, the world throws our, our way. And if you think it's a really important question, as I do, that it's a big part of being a disciple or an apprentice of Jesus, you know, to get your arms and legs around this, well, who am I really? What is my true identity? Then you're actually in good company throughout church history. St. Augustine, from the fourth century, in his autobiography about his conversion to Christ, is, uh, has, says that, um, wrote this famous prayer. He said, Grant, O Lord, that I may know, my, know myself, that I may know, that I may know thee. In other words, he's saying, how can I come closer to God if I don't recognize like who I'm not and who he is and come to grips with, if I don't come to grips with that, isn't that like, one, what's the first of the uh, 10, uh, is it 10 steps in AA? Is, is the first one to admit there's a problem? <clears throat> it's like, you know, I've got to know myself and that's really kind of what he is getting at here. I, I have been sick this week and so I'm going to cough here if you don't mind, but I'm going to try not to do it in my mic and I'm going to turn around because it's none of your dang business. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so John, John Cal I don't know, John Calvin said our, these words, and I put it in your talk notes, our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. I quoted this Catholic monk last uh, week, and, and in the past, Thomas uh, Merton, uh, he, he said it like this in his book on prayer, for me to be a saint means to be myself. For me to be a saint, that is, you know, this follower of Jesus, someone set apart, you know, to um, glorify God and join him forever is to, is to be able to come to grips with this question, who, who, am I? who am I? Who am I really? And he goes on to say, therefore, the challenge of sanctity being becoming more like um, our Lord and what we were meant to be and made in his image and salvation is this problem of finding out who I am and discovering what my true self is. And here's what he did not mean, what often we imagine in our culture this to mean. He doesn't mean it in some sort of therapeutic self-help sense, like some sort of emotional salve or candy corn uh, approach. That Stuart Smalley from the old days when we didn't watch Saturday Night Live then either, but somehow I know this, where he would... You know, he like sort of like this self-help kind of coach, and he'd say, "Just you know, remember you're you're good enough." I'm going to be really careful not to do the voice, <laughs> um, but I can't hardly help myself. <laughs> That's kind of lispy, is all I'm trying to tell you. 
Um, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you, you know, just be you, kind of a thing. I am, you know, good thing my mom is, you know, died a couple years ago. She would be ashamed <laughs> if she was sitting in here hearing that. And they hear, I don't know, I don't know whether to let the peanut gallery chime in every week, you know what I'm saying? You might have had something really funny, Is it, was it going to be funny or mean? Okay, so yes, yes, you are uniquely you, the Bible tells us, I think it's the Psalms, that it say you were fearfully and wonderfully made, and that's true about you. And you know what else is true about you and me is that um, our soul's kind of twisted, it's kind of turned inward. And, and what's unique about us is the unique, unique ways that we're twisted and the unique ways that we've, we sin and have sinned. And, and it leaves us as confused as poor old Alice in Wonderland. Who are you? And I think in no, in no small part, it's because I think we... Um, you know, in no small part, I think it's because we, we just have this fear regarding the love of God, you know, and, and whether we can really be free and have the courage to face our shadow side and the lies that we've believed and built our, and rooted our identities in. And, and I think also, you know, just a community, a family, you know, of brothers and sisters of Jesus' apprentices that, you know, that we can be honest with and, and know, that, know that we're loved. But instead of that, it's too often we just stay stuck in these loops of just unhealthy and toxic patterns. And, and it's just true, generally. In fact, I would say, you know, I, especially I've done enough um, funeral and memorial services over the years that have a, a higher mix of people who are far from God. And far too many, you know, contentedly so. And it's like, man, my heart just breaks when I'm speaking to a group of people, you know, that... Um, and, I, and, and I just, you know, um, here's my point. My point is, is that a, a vast majority of people will go to their graves without ever knowing the real answer to who are you, who am I, what is my, my life. Yeah. Sorry about that, but, you know, I did a funeral yesterday, so it just reminded me afresh of... Um, you know, what's at stake? Why it matters? And so there are lots of scriptures that speak to our true identity and, and examples we can, could get into, but you, you quit listening long before I quit talking. So I'll just mention one, you know, here's the Son of God born in flesh. And when, you know, theologically there's some... Um, differences and disagreement and uncertainty about when when was when Jesus was an infant in the in the in the um, manger <laughs> did he it's like hey, well, you know I can't wait to get out of this diaper you know I am God and all but I mean, we know by age 12 he went to the temple to be about his father's business but you know when exactly you know did he become fully aware of of being you know, laying aside the prerogatives of deity, as it says in Philippians 2, and then, and then being God with us and knowing fully that. I don't know, but I know this. I know that after his baptism by John, when he came up out of the water, it says the Spirit of God descended upon him, and then his voice came from his Father in heaven and said, this is my beloved Son. And so, where do we get our identity? I would, I would, think, that, um, I would think that the best place to get it is from the, a voice from heaven, you know, from, from God and from God's, from God's word. And so, here's the question, where do you get yours? Where do we generally, typically get ours? Is it, you know, from the voice of our heavenly father or is it from a voice much closer to the earth? Where do we ground our sense of who am I? Of course, some of the probably very obvious, you know, toxic patterns that we get stuck in, and I put them in your talk notes, and, and the first one would be we get our identities from our performance. And if you're filling in the blank, it'd be, it's like, I am what I do. You want to know who I am? I'll tell you what I do, and you'll know who I am. 
And, and it starts early in life, does it not? You get perfect attendance awards, right? I mean, I heard people do. Um, you win the spelling bee. Those things are designed by Satan. <laughs> I hated them. I go, couldn't I just sit here, cut out the middleman? Why do I got to humiliate myself in front of everyone? You get, a, you get a trophy when you win. You're voted prom queen or king. You get the letterman's jacket. And the message is clear. If you accomplish something, then people notice, and you kind of feel good about yourself, right? So let's just build on that. I'll build the answer to the question, who am I, on that. And I'll tell you when it gets really sick, it, because, you know, you, you're going to graduate um, or get kicked out eventually, but if you get kicked out, probably performance isn't going to be your gig. <laughs> um, it, when it really gets sick is, is you start to live that out in your children's lives and their accomplishments. And uh, you've seen this. People will put bumper stickers on the back of the car. Uh, my kid's an honor student. Uh, I'll never forget Mr. Reynolds, um, senior truck parked up here not that many uh, decades ago. It says, bumper sticker, proud father. My kid beat up your honor student. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so there. Um, <coughs> when you... <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> when you meet someone, what's typically one of the very first questions they ask you? What do you do? What do you do? Uh, now, um, you know, in the case of Mr. Reynolds, oftentimes the question is, now, why exactly did your son beat up my kid? I can't, why was that? You know. But it's like, what, what do you do? You go, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. I pastor a church. Oh, really? How big's your church? Well, counting me. <laughs> uh, you know, hey, what do you do? Well, actually, I'm a stay-at-home mom. Uh, you, you know, but, I, but I'm really involved, like, in, you know, the PTA association, and, you know, I run this and that and the other, and, you know, because that's such a low calling. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, they're just is, the, the pressure just is kind of on, hey, what do you do? You know, um, you know, who are you? What do you do? One cultural critic calls it like this resume virtue. You ever been to like a class reunion? I'll never forget when I went to the 20th, my 20th class reunion. And, uh, you know, it, and it just, hey, hey, what are you doing? What do you do? What's, and people would talk about their careers. Um, it became apparent um, not just as what they do, but who they are. You know, as their, as their identity, King Solomon, he tried all of these and more that we have on your notes. He said, my heart took delight in all my labor, and it was the reward, say, and this was the reward for all my toil. He said, yet when I achieved all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was, you know, was it... It just couldn't bear the weight of a soul. Couldn't really meet my deep, the deepest aches of my heart. It couldn't answer that really important question, man, who are you? And I, it, it turned out it was just like chasing after wind. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, this is a first world problem, not a developing world problem, but a first world problem in a and a, and a uh, how do I want to say this here? Uh, in, in this um, achievement kind of society is this incredible dilemma, an epidemic of, of mental illness symptoms, symptoms of, of depression and feelings of insecurity and inferiority, of failure. They're just a, a hallmark of, of an achievement kind of culture. Think about how many times you've heard celebrities and high achievers um, in, in the media talk about, well, you know, I have a therapist, I go to therapy. Well, well of course you do. You know, because achievement can't bear the weight of, weight of a soul. And so, and, and really in our, um, our, our well, let, let me do this. How about we just do a quick, give you a quick uh, uh, pop quiz. It's, it's called the Significance IQ Quiz. I'll just rattle off really quickly, uh, and you'll have to think fast here. It's, the, it's called the Game of Tens. Can you name the 10 wealthiest people in the world? 
Can you name the last 10 uh, times men or women of the year? Can you name the top 10 corporate ex executives in, in the United States? Can you name the last 10 presidents? Can you name the last 10 Nobel Prize winners? Can you name the last, can you name 10 members of the president's cabinet? Can you name 10 um, of People's Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People? The last 10 Academy Award winners? The name of the last decade's worth of, of World Series winners? Of course you can't. And neither can those who won, won those accolades. In fact, in many cases, it only just increased their, their anxiety and their depression and their you know, lack of a sense of who they really are, what they really are. Number two here, the, uh, people get their identities from their possessions. It's, uh, so it's sort of, a, you fill in the blank here, what I, I am, what I have. Did you notice the neighborhood in which I live? It's a very nice neighborhood. Yeah, in our house, have you noticed? It's a very, very, very fine house with two cats in the yard or something. Yeah, they get in my yard and it's, that's all I'm telling you, <laughs> get them cats out of my yard. Get your own bark dust. Okay, I digress. Uh, have you seen uh, what, I, what I text on? Oh, does your phone just have that one little lens? You know, <laughs> You know, have you seen mine? Yes, I noticed. Couldn't help. Yes. You seen what I drive? Where I vacation? Have, did you, my hot bod, my hot rod. You know, I, Marcy was doing, went, I think I dropped her off at the hospital for some kind of exam of some sort. And I went down to a little coffee shop not too far. This is over in Corvallis. A cafe culture. And I found a table because I thought, well, you know, I'm going to look at some ball scores. I don't even remember what, or I'm going to work on something. And I got a table all by myself. A big table, big long table, lots of empty tables. And, and I got a cup of coffee and I sat down and a man came and put it like this little booklet on the table. And then he went and got coffee. I thought, I hope he's just leaving it there for a minute. But he came back and he sat down across from me. And then he opened his book. You know what it's full of? Um, pins, souvenir pins from Disneyland. That was just a sample of all of them that he has, and I got to hear about all of them that he has. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, it's like um, I was annoyed, and then I was kind of heartbroken. You know, here's a man probably 10, 15 years older than me, and it's like, who are you? Well, I'm the Disneyland pin collecting champion of the world. Yeah, man, it's, you know, it makes me sad to think about it now it's like you can't help but wonder if you know behind all of those pins is is really a deep insecurity and a and a soul cry for hey um somebody notice me somebody like me somebody somebody love me and and we live in this materialistic society where we've linked together work and possessions and and so the American mantra is not completely unlike the directions on your shampoo bottle. It's like work more, buy more, repeat. Work more, buy more, repeat. Eventually you'll get there. You'll be a somebody and not a nobody. People will notice. And so in this secularization of, of, of our Western culture over, and, and it's just kind of... Um, really um, exponentially increased, in, I think, in recent years. As we become more secular, we've, we've filled this void that God used to hold um, with materialism, you know? And, and so now, you know, it's not as though we don't have a religion, it's just that religion has become materialism. And shopping has become the worship, and Amazon.com has become the temple, and Jeff Bezos has become the high priest, and we're still very religious, because we're still all trying to figure out who am I, what am I, what is my identity. It's not hard to spot. I went uh, a number of years ago to see if I could get a car radio put in this truck that I bought, used truck that I bought, that the radio was kind of not really working. And, and while I was there, this young man, you know, I, I say a kid, Increasingly, the world seems to be filled with more and more kids, and I don't know how that happens. But, you know, his, his whole back of his car, seats and everything were taken out. It was nothing but speakers. 
And uh, he couldn't, I mean, he didn't know me from Adam, but he couldn't wait to just, man, please notice me. And he turned that sucker on, and the windows were just going like this. And when he wound the window dan- down, my hair was going like that. And I said, you are freaking awesome. You are somebody. I didn't realize what a nobody I am. I think I'm just going to skip radio altogether. Yeah, it's not that hard to spot. And the point is, is there... You know, for lots of people, they're, you know, they're different things, but it's not that hard to spot. Uh, thirdly here, other people find their identity rooted in pleasure. It's, I am what I want. And of course, in our hypersexualized you know, culture, um, you know, a lot of people just find themselves literally defined by, by that, by their sexuality or by their orientation nowadays or their identification. And so and you have just people as confused as Alice, you know, who are identifying, you know, with some kind of a group, it's, and, and it's just so not who they are. And it's that thing I said about that uh, illusionary truth effect. And they knew it, and they know it. But you hear it long enough, and you're like, you want to believe it's true until you do believe it's true. And that's what happens when you're taken captive, isn't it? Don't let anyone take you captive. So identity gets rooted in, in, in pleasure, uh, you know, and it, it could be, you know, it, in our society, it's a lot of that. And it's not just that, you know. Some of us are foodies or, you know, whatever gives us that endorphin rush. You know, we travel. It's wine, women, and song, the next gambling junket, you know, it's, I am what I want, I am, am, I am what, I, what I feel. And, and so I'm on this, I'm this hamster, boogity, 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 chasing down that wheel, and i still as confused as Alice. That's where it always ends. I don't know if you know who Russell Brand is, but he, he was once married to, who's that other lady that I can't think of her name, was on that other show that I don't care about. Um, that uh, idol, American Idol. Right, uh, and so you know he was this sex addict, this drug addict, and um, he could never feel the emptiness, fill the emptiness in his soul. And so he's been like 20 years sober, and it's been interesting watching him from time to time this kind of spiritual journey he's been on, and it's really interesting because I've heard him say recently, like. Because he got into this kind of new age Eastern kind of stuff, look in, you know, the God within and all that. And he realized, my goodness, how empty is that? Talking to yourself. <laughs> and, it, and it's as if the Lord is slowly kind of drawing. I don't know where he is in this journey. But I know where he was. And it was on a street called Empty. And King Solomon knew all about it and wrote a whole book in the Bible for us. So we don't have to travel that same path. But I've heard him recently talking about you know prayer and talking to Jesus and and then taking reading and taking people through Rick Warren's book What on Earth Am I Am Here Here For That Christian book, then the next book is another Christian book Messy Spirituality and so my my point is is that this is a well worn path and you don't have to learn it the hard way King Solomon said this in the second chapter put it in your notes I kept my heart from pleasure. I, I kept my heart from no pleasure. It's just pedal to the metal. He said, and I said to myself, come on, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But you know what I found out? This too proved to be meaningless. And then lastly here is um, that people look to, and it is not an, by any means a comprehensive you know, list, but they're, I think they're four biggies. And so this fourth area where people wrongly try to ground their identity is in popularity. And so if you're filling in your notes, it's I am what other people think I am. That's who I am. I am who you say I am. I mean, why would I not? You know, from, from early ages, like I get straight A's and my parents put a bumper sticker on. You know, I, I join a gang and it's like now I'm a somebody, not a nobody. I'm, I'm accepted. You know, if I can sit at the cool kids' table in the lunchroom, then I, I know I'm accepted. I know that I must be cool too, right? Isn't that the way it works? 
If the cool kids accept me, then doesn't that make me a cool kid? If I preach a good sermon and afterwards someone says, hey, uh, that was a good message, pastor. It's like, then you know I'm a somebody and not a nobody, right? But don't think I don't know how this works. Oh, I know how this works. Sir, sermon sort of circled the drain. <laughs> and you know what I'm going to hear afterwards? I mean, it'd be better if you just said, hey, nice try, you know. <laughs> hey, you know, a 500 hitter in baseball is a, is a Hall of Famer pastor. <laughs> I mean, that would be better than what people would otherwise say. They go, oh, have a good week. <laughs> I hope you're not up preaching next Sunday. Um, <clears throat> here's, you know what, it's a snare. It's a snare, and the Bible tells us that. Fear, the fear of man will prove to be a snare. Man, but whoever trusts the Lord will be kept safe. You know, First John, we read it. And you don't want to miss out building your one life on the one thing that is true and eternal and real. That is the love of God and who you are in him. And some of us just never, never seem to outgrow high school cafeteria kind of thinking. Remember those days? I remember those days. It was like, oh man, not the cafeteria where all the cool kids are. You ever walk into a, a room, you know, or, or a, say a church, maybe like this morning, and I bet this is true with some of you, where, you know, you, you, or maybe a community group, or maybe that's why some people don't get in a small group of others. Or maybe you felt that way at work, at the workplace, and it's just like, you know, you, you just feel this pressure. It's like there's this weight on your soul. And, you know, all of these weights weigh heavy on a soul, as Martin Luther said, that are turned inward on themselves. But there's this weight to be cooler, to look better, to be funnier than you really are, smarter than you really are, more put together than you really are, better looking than you really are. Ever felt that kind of pressure? You know, to kind of project an image that isn't quite keeping with reality? I think all of us have. It's like this airbrushed version of ourselves. And I mean that metaphorically because, you know, it's just always been since the history of humanity and when we fell into souls turned on themselves but I also mean it literally. I mean, this age-old human condition has been exacerbated by social media and by culture, and man, you can just get sucked into that, can't you? And it, and it, and it just can eat you alive. Could you find yourself you know, in this kind of competition almost with yourself, if not everyone else, to always seem cooler or better looking or more successful or having more fun or better put together, better behaved kids. And the Bible tells us, that, man, it's, and it's a snare. It's an emotional snare and it's an emotional state that just leaves you like a yo-yo rising and falling, rising and falling. And, and you won't always be a rising when you ground your identity in such things. And so I've mentioned that song that Switchfoot did by a, I think it's uh, cigarette smokers or I don't know, chain smokers or something. They redid a song. Switchfoot's a Christian band. And I just, it's just really hit me when I listened to their, to their cover of that song. And the words of the song include, don't believe the narcissism. Make no mistake, I live in a prison that I built myself. It's my religion. And they say I'm a sick boy. Welcome to the narcissism. Feed yourself with my life's work. You know, you see me, notice me, like me, love me, am, am I okay? And then there's just this refrain of how many lives is my life how many likes is my life worth? How many? How many likes is my life worth? I mean, think about the cultural phenomena of a of a selfie. On one level, it's kind of fun and playful, isn't it? You can get a laugh. People are goofy or whatever. Marcy and I take them when we go somewhere, and we just send them to the kids to spare you. But it's like, you know, I, I get in my feed, you know, 
selfies that, you know, aren't so fun, aren't so light or playful. But it's like, you know, the serious face. You know, it's a different low-cut shirt each time, but it's the same kind of face. And on a surface level, you know, I look at that and think, you know, that's kind of stupid, kind of vain, you know, kind of attention-sinking, kind of unnecessary, but, you know... At a deeper level, you know, and I feel like I did when I sat across that coffee table. You know, I feel like I couldn't help but wonder, you know, how, how deep the insecurity, you know, how deep the, the, the soul ache for somebody love me, somebody like me, somebody notice me, somebody pay attention. Will somebody pay attention? I mean, even if I have to, exact, I mean, if I'm building on this, even if I have to, not lie, but exaggerate a little, little brag, airbrush, strip down to my bra. Will somebody please pay attention? And um, the odds are when you see that, you, you really get a glimpse into somebody who's building their identity, an identity that's being shaped and rooted on, on what other people think. And it's a, tr- and it's a tragic thing indeed. Not an exhaustive list. Maybe in your small groups you can talk about it more. And uh, did we fix that clock? Is it really 10 after? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about Pacific time. I'm talking about Japan. What time is it in Japan? <laughs> so I know how much longer I have to go here. Yeah, it's really dangerous. And I put just three, four things here to put in your notes. The danger is, and, and I, you know, you're going to have to, are you up next week? You're going to have to get, I'll give you the last pages and then you can do that or something different and I can come back to this. But I need to end or otherwise they're going to say at the end of the service, have a nice week. <laughs> Here's the danger. You know, you root, root your identity in that. When your identity is tied to that, it's, it's very, you know, your identity is, is, is tied to it, your sense of self, self-worth. You know, to the answer, the answer to the question, who am I? Man, tie it tenuously to those things and, man, it'll, it'll let you down. It's tied to also a sense of security, man, because, you know, we want to we wanna belong. I mean, we can't help it. We gravitate towards some sort of group or tribe, some kind of community, because everybody, we want a place where everybody knows your name, where everybody's glad you, you came. We all want it, and we all gravitate in one way or another towards that. And for some people, it's based around their you know, sexuality. Others, it's based around socioeconomic status or your little theological you know, predisposition or persuasion over against others or some hobby or some sport. We, we gravitate to belong to a tribe we want a tribe we want to belong the danger is is whenever we build our identity on any of these kinds of things man it, it'll you've built in Jesus's um, metaphor on shifting sand not only can it be taken from you it will be taken from you because there will always end up someone better looking someone smarter you know if you built build your identity on your, on your job or your career? What happens then when your career, when, you're, when you lose your job? You don't get the promotion. Or, or you're 30 and you still don't even know what you're going to do with your life, and yet accomplishment or, you know, what I do is who I am. Or what about, like, in the next couple of years when you're replaced by a robot? Then what? Who am I when I lose my hair? Who am I when I lose my following? Who am I when my kids move out of the house? Okay, I'm out of time. And that's a really lame place to end, but you know, it's not the worst sermon I ever preached. Can I give you a homework assignment? (laughs) How am I to take that? Why don't you read um, Ephesians 1, maybe later today, maybe in your home group. 
It's sort of, uh, you might call a ground zero of, of a theological grounding or basis for, you, for your identity, who you are in Christ, and just highlight those as you go through. I mean, it's it just like, you know, Paul is just like, here's who you are. And then he'll spend, and he'll do that for three chapters, and then the last three chapters he'll talk about, in light of that, this is who you're becoming. I got, is the band going to come up and bail me out here? I mean, if you guys came up and started playing music, have you ever seen like a TV show where the organ starts playing? No, I don't. Um. Actually, I'd like to invite everybody here to be home city council. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, you know, like, can I illustrate it this way? Um, the, uh, you know, I got married a, a few years back. And I was a, quite a Yahoo. Yahoo? How do they say that? Knucklehead? Um, and, uh, and, we got, and I got married because we said, like, um, you know, before God, we vowed. And, 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 I, and I was, like, 100% married. That was my new identity. I was a husband. And wait, is my wife in here? Am I... I'm better at it than I was then, right? You like, remember when I was like mean and stuff and wasn't really working? Remember that? Try not to. <laughs> That's what you'll see in Ephesians, right? Man, this is who you are. You are in Christ. You're in Christ. And when God sees you, he sees him. You've been incorporated into all that he did and who he is. And that is your identity, right? And then part of apprenticeship and, you know, being, coming more like him is this process. Therefore, in light of that, in light of the answer to the larvas, is that a larva? Is he a larva, that hookah-smoking caterpillar? In light of his question, really important question. In light of that, then become who you are. <laughs>